right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Catherine and Michael Redman, who are just up the coast a little bit in Northern California in Chico. How are you doing, Michael and Catherine? We're doing great. We're doing John. well, John. Thank you very much for having us. And this is nice, you know, it's not often we have two people on. It's not often we have two people on who are sweethearts and best friends and the husband and wife team behind half a bubble out Habo, a marketing and business consulting firm. Uh, so yeah, this is the first time I've had sweethearts on. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, don't have an argument in the middle of this, please. Uh, and uh, um, yeah. And what we want to talk about today actually is a fascinating book uh, that you both <clears throat> both authored called Fulfilled, the Passion and Provision Strategy for Building a Business with Profit, Purpose and Legacy. And as I was I was looking through some of the some of the book, it's a great I mean, it, it's a great model and everything you come up with. But I think the lead into it is really fascinating about mm -hmm. how you st how you started a business and you discovered all of the things that most people uh, discover when they start a business. Everything takes longer, it's harder, all of the, all those other things, you you know, your cash flow tends to run out because maybe you sell some stuff and you think, way revenue, and then you go, oh shoot, I'm not getting paid yet, so I have no cash in the bank. You know? <laughs> all of that good yeah. stuff. Oh, so, that happens. Yeah, so just, uh, just talk through your early experience when you started, when you started your company and and how difficult it was and what what lessons you've learned now when you look back on that early that beginning stage what you would do differently oh that's a great question in the early stages we i, mean, I feel like we lived the uh entrepreneur dream in the beginning like we started it in the spare bedroom we moved to the converted garage and then finally moved into uh what we would have called our real office a real building uh that we didn't have to mow the lawn in front of our house for people to visit and as we did that, uh, we were just going, okay, you know, like any entrepreneur, I've got an idea of what we're going to do, but, but then all of a sudden you start realizing you have to fill it out and what are the things you're going to offer and how are you going to communicate and how are you going to market? And because we were doing marketing and, and basic advertising in the beginning and providing videos and websites and doing all that kind of stuff, it's like, okay, we know how to do that, but we thought we knew how to sell. And I think that one of the biggest challenges in the early days was I had always been a good salesperson, but, and Catherine had been in sales too at the corporate level. And, and all of a sudden we realized it was a lot of struggle to try and balance getting work done for clients and actually continuing to go out there and sell and be a part of that. And you got to the point where you're overwhelmed and you just wanted to focus on one and it usually wasn't on selling. And, and that was kind of the way it, that was kind of a lot of what it started out with is, and then over time, as we refined ourselves and refined our messages, started gaining clients and gaining momentum, you know, it was just, it was spits and spats, right? You know, you're moving and you're doing a little better. And then you hit a dry spell because you went back to working on projects, not selling, and you would ride that roller coaster. And we started finding a groove for the most part, even though it was tough and, and rough. And then we hit kind of that opportunity you'd been preparing for, but some people might say it was luck. It was just an opportunity, like you were ready for it. And it allowed us to grow from a modest income to 4X in 18 months. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. It was and, amazing and, most people... and, and it was awful. Yeah, and it was. So I was gonna. I was gonna say that because most people would say, "Wow, fantastic! You made it through. You got through the hard part, right. and then success came your way, and life was just fantastic." But not so. Uh, you right. know what? We've never looked back. We have smooth sailing off into the sunset. No, <laughs> actually, what was so funny about it is, there is. I don't know what could be much more painful than four hundred percent growth in eighteen months in a company, but it was painful, and. It was, there was, there was a, obviously there was a gift in it because, you know, suddenly you're not worried about cash in the bank for the first time in your fledgling company, like, whoo, we got money. Um, but what we discovered was that in the process of growing that fast, we, we made some really, um, I would say poor decisions yeah. that were just reactive. Right. So, so we hired people that probably weren't the best fit for us and the job wasn't the best fit for them. We let clients in the door that we didn't like and and 
we're really suck the life out of you know, us. The, the Saturday afternoon at three o'clock at Costco with your kid, and this guy feels like he can call you and and tell you why he's frustrated. His stuff isn't working, and you let him because you know you don't want to. Like, okay, all of those things, right? So, so when we look back, what we would say is that our company had outgrown our ability to lead it. Mm. Mm. And so we hit the place where we just like, I did not want to cross the threshold of work on a Monday morning. I looked at, here's his office. Here's, we have a big sign in front. We built this thing. I don't want to go in. And that was, that was uh, kind of that period of time. And it was really hard. Mm. And it was interesting. Cause like, I mean, one of the funny parts about that story is just what was it? What was the niche that actually helped us grow? is we were marketing a toenail fungus treatment. I know, and who knew? <laughs> yeah, who knew? Who knew you could use laser on your toes and that would be a good gift. And it literally took <laughs> us to 20, almost 25 different cities across the United States and in London. And, yeah. and you know, we'd gone from the spare bedroom to the garage door office to across the country and across the pond. And, and it was like, it was all those things that you want in the dream, right? You're thinking, if I could just hit the home run, if we could just do this, if we could just do that. And, and we actually did it. There's cash in the bank. We, before we grew, we were a mid six figure company. So mm-hmm. we did that 400%. So we beat all kinds of odds in business growth and the statistics of the businesses. And for a moment, for a moment, it was wonderful. And there was, it wasn't any pain, but it was kind of like that moment where you see that big 747 that they test astronauts in where they go all the way up and then they turn over and go down and you have this 30 seconds of glee and then all of a sudden you go smack (laughs) and we went through our 30 seconds and then all of a sudden we were like this is all the pain and it was because we didn't have the leadership as Catherine said we didn't have the structure and there is that we have noticed over 20 years that that ebb and flow that leaders have to go through because you grow if you'll grow your leadership and grow your skills as a business person then your company can grow and come up and sometimes they come up a little bit more but then you have to grow again and then you have to do that and if your business comes above your ability to lead it will most surely come back down and if it if it has enough momentum it will come way down and um, it happened to us yeah. So what? So what? Um, what are some of the? How do you identify, as you said here, that you've gone above your ability to lead, or the business has outgrown your ability to lead? How does somebody uh, identify that? That's a great, great question. question. Uh, one of the, I'll start. Yeah, so please. One of the ways that we knew we had grown beyond our ability to lead was that our culture was no fun anymore. So um, I have a high value for fun. If I'm not having fun, I don't want to play. I just don't. So I, and I, I want my work, the place I spend all this time with people I care about, I want it to be somewhere I want to be. And we had hit the place where literally it was no fun. It was, it was, a, it was a little bit toxic and really uncomfortable. So that's one sure sign is when everybody in your company is a little miserable and they're making you miserable, something's gone wrong. So that's one, for sure. you. <laughs> You know, that's good. I'm sitting here thinking now she's telling the story and I'm like, oh yeah, that, that takes me back to three stories already and I'm lost in them. I think I need a drink. Um, <laughs> you can pop I some think, whiskey in your coffee there and nobody will notice. Right. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that stood out to me in the midst of that was not only the, the culture, but what we call, um, what we all talk about as being, uh, the name just to miss me, but basically burnout. That's what I'm trying to talk about. When burnout starts to happen, and at this point, we actually covered the company. We actually grew the company back. And now, and that was over 12 years ago when all of that happened. And we're celebrating 20 years. We've got, we started another company after that that's growing and thriving in the seven figures also. And, And we continue to grow that model. But what we realized is what we want from a company, and this was really critical, we want from a company that it to be financially profitable and growing. So we want it financially healthy. We want it to be rewarding or fulfilling when we're going to work. I mean, if we're going to spend that much time and energy, let's do that. And then we want it to avoid burnout. We don't want burnout to happen. And over the, over the years, as we've been coaching leaders and doing consulting and shifting our business even more towards that, we've realized there are four stages of burnout. 
And when you walk through those stages, it's, it's progressive and you can get to stage three from one to three. And it's just that growing, I'm exhausted. It's hard mm -hmm. to recover. But if you don't catch it, the next step is we all know somebody who's gone through burnout where they don't get off the couch anymore. It takes them months, yeah. if not a year to recover if they're willing to go through the process and they're a waste. They're just, and they're frustrated in the process. So realizing that when that exhaustion starts to happen and you start to feel frazzled and chaotic and frustrated, there's probably a good chance, especially when you feel like you're on the hamster wheel, that you're moving past your leadership skill and it's time to take your leadership to the next level. Level up your leadership and figure out a way to do that. And you can do it. A lot of people don't believe they can, but you can. And then things can come back down and you can have the profitability and the fulfillment without the burnout. Yeah, interesting about the interesting about burnout because to some degree, right, right, we live in a culture that celebrates, uh, mm. celebrates, you know, working 24 seven, always on the go, always active. And it's almost like, you know, the people who are more calm and more, you know, uh, manage their time and do everything like that. They're kind of, hmm, they're, they're always looked on a little bit with suspicion, which is crazy. But we do, we live it. We live in a culture that celebrates, it's almost like burnout is almost like a badge of honor. Yeah, it's really funny because it, I mean, living in California, we've even as we were talking before the show, uh, Silicon Valley is a huge influence, especially on the West Coast. And now in current times, we've got friends in in the Northeast Corridor in Boston and places like that that have their own Silicon Valley-esque atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And now they're starting to suffer from the same thing. There's that grind and how many hours can you work? And, and I remember, I mean, you probably remember this, when the... San Francisco Chronicle, the newspaper out of San Francisco, for those aren't, who aren't on the West Coast, this is the big newspaper, was doing business stories on how amazing it was that A, you could have a bed at work under your desk. And this was like a, a, a pro thing that was like, hey, Shower we're going to get, and you could work for a company that gave you unlimited vacation. Do you remember that? Yeah. unlimited vacation yeah. and i'm like and i remember people telling me this is amazing look what they're doing michael you should do this with your company i'm like that's the biggest scam in the world and then the research came out three or four la years later that said if you were offered unlimited leadership or unlimited vacation people took actually less vacation yeah 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 and you're like this was just something that sounded good it was a lot of hype but it fed into that whole if i just work more I'll be okay. I'll have enough. We'll do enough. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't end. It's a hamster wheel. Yeah. So how much do you think that, I think it, the, if there's one upside of the pandemic, it's, I think it brought kind of mental health a little bit more into focus than it has before. And I think that's one of the things that uh, when you look at how you work and how you operate and how your company operates, that nowadays, I think we have to be a lot more, conscious of you know, when people are heading to burnout when people look like they're they're breaking down because it's i i think it's something that we have ignored for a long time and now we we really need to take uh, take notice of absolutely that's a really good point yeah i mean i think like most companies during the pandemic you go remote and and you do the working from a distance thing and and depending on who you are as a human that either goes real well because you really like it or if you're a raging extrovert, it's like a prescription for insanity, right? So we definitely had both sides of the spectrum, but we we really had to start asking on a regular basis, like on a scale of one to 10, just mentally, emotionally, how you doing? And then really sort of helping folks recalibrate and adjust things so that they could find a place to be productive and effective. Well, so caring for those people that way. And, and we have a... <laughs> This is going to sound self-lauding, and I don't mean it to. It's just more of an example. We have a very, very healthy company that's very, very profitable. And, and obviously, as entrepreneurs and businesses, we like that. Uh, there's very little drama, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of profit. So those are great things. But one of the things we've realized that takes discipline as a leader is, and, and I still cringe sometimes when somebody else says it and I don't, is when one of the leaders tells one of our employees we don't want you to work this weekend. We don't, your, your kid is sick. Would you please take, please take the sick work. time we gave you. We gave it to you for a reason mm -hmm. and take care of your kids or, 
or something along those lines. It's like, no, you, you shouldn't have to do that. If you've got work left over at the end of the day, leave it till tomorrow. We're all going to be okay. Yeah. And consequently, you have to help coach your team because people are going to, especially people who care, are going to tend to push a little bit more. I think the people who care actually push more than the people who yeah. are just kind of being whipped and tried to, tried to use fear in the midst of leadership. Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, there's a lot of people who would sort of go, oh, is this a trap? Is this a trap? Yeah. If I don't do the work, you know, is, I'm, is this going to come back on me? Are they being genuine? Right. Yeah, there's definitely a building of trust that has to happen in a culture for people to feel mm -hmm. like, like I, when you say that, you actually mean it. Like, and with, there's no trick. It's not a, not a scam. And with burnout, we were talking this morning, but I was, as we were talking, you have to be on the guard of burnout, no matter who you are business owner, especially business leaders, we can just like, well, you know, I'm just going to work an extra couple hours here and an extra couple hours there. And it may not feel bad because we're enjoying it, but at the same time, the cumulative effect of too many hours and not taking care of ourselves. So it's not like this Pollyanna, I just decide I'm not going to do it. You actually have to be aware of it and stay on top of it. And again, I go back to when it starts to happen. Sometimes it's that regular sharpening of your, your competencies, your leadership skills, what's going on. And getting help on the outside, getting coaching, getting finding a mentor or something on a regular basis is super critical and helpful. And, and because Catherine and I coach, we know it's valuable, but we've had a coach, a leadership coach for the last 10 years. And I don't know if we would have navigated some of the challenges that life has brought us personally and professionally if we hadn't had that. Yeah, I, I say this ad nauseum, to be honest, on, on, on this podcast, but you mentioned coaching and you know i've had coaches myself in the past and uh, i think it's something that is so overlooked by so many people wow. and and the thing that i always compare it to is like ask anybody what, what what do you like to do for fun what's your hobby and maybe they'll say well i'll play tennis or i play golf or whatever and you say uh, oh do you ever take golf lessons oh yeah you yeah, know i have i take golf lessons regularly but and you think okay so you take lessons for your hobby but you don't have anybody to help you with what puts bread on your table. Yeah, it's yeah. a really interesting thing. I mean, Perfect. The, it's, it's, such, it's a great way of putting it. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we know because we are leaders and we talk to leaders all the time is there's this false sense of, I, I shouldn't need help. I should, yeah. I should have this, right? And, and I think, and, and the more successful you are, actually, the more you're bringing in the dollars and everyone's applauding your success, the more you grow in your um, sort of false belief that that's true. Like I can't ask for help because it's gonna make me look weak. So I think that, you mm -hmm. know, we talked with leaders and we were talking about a guy just a few weeks ago who made a statement that was so powerful to me. He said, you know, he, he hit this place, he was, in his, he was in his like mid forties and he just had to own that where he was living was this sense of, he used the term smoldering discontent. Mm -hmm. Right, where where like you're killing it, you're killing it in business, but and you're making money, and you're but somehow things aren't right. Like your relationships are getting sacrificed, and you're you're not actually living life. Your 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 job owns you, your business owns you, and so I think that that happens, and and it isn't until somebody sometimes from the outside can just say, hey, whoa, you know, whether you invite them in or whether it's a good friend who kicks you in the patootie, I mean, you need help. Right. Yeah. We, we always say one of our favorite sayings is it's really hard to read the label from inside the bottle. Oh, very good. I like that one. I'm going to going to note that one down. That's a yeah, write that one down. Excellent. One. I write that one down. Yeah, that's a writer uh, downer. <laughs> yeah, that's a writer downer for sure. Um, and, you, and I think it's interesting because part one of your book is about the why. And I feel this and I feel this is relevant, not just for business owners or leaders or entrepreneurs, but for everybody. Mm. Uh, I, I think everybody needs to ask themselves why they do what they do. What is the purpose? I mean, you may think, well, I just go to work and I earn money to feed my family. OK, but but look a little deeper. There's got to be something a little deeper if you're going to have if you're going to have the passion to to really you know give it your best. There has to be some why. And that's why I love the part one of your book is the why. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we talk about what it takes to actually be able to sustain and persevere in business and it it really is that it's knowing why am i doing this why do, why did i start this thing to begin with why did i join this company what was i hoping for 
and, and really being able to stay in tune with that because there are lots of days where it would be just easier to pull the covers back over your head and, and not keep going because it's just yeah. hard. You know, owning a business is hard, running a business is hard. Here in California, I don't know, it seems to get harder every day. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. so I think that-, that, that that's, a, that's another podcast completely. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. Because let us not digress. Um, but yeah, I think um, just knowing, you know, what, kind of your values, like why, how is it that I want to conduct business and life, right? Where am I going? What, what would actually happen in the world if I got there? Like if mm -hmm. we as a company actually achieve what we want to do achieve, what would change? And is that worth it? Do we want to be the dog that chased the car and caught the car and then don't know what yeah. to do with it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's so fascinating that because I do think sometimes, uh, you know, people may come up with, this is what I want and this is my goal but they don't really dig into why that is their goal. And as you said, and what would happen if they achieved that goal? What, what, what difference would it make to their life? Because I think sometimes we go a bit grandiose and we think, oh, if I just have this, then everything will fall into place. And that never happens. So I think, I think you really also have to have incremental, you, know, you have to have incremental goals, but you also have to understand exactly what is the outcome that you're, you're looking for in the end. The, the more nebulous you, you leave that, the more you're likely to go astray. Yeah, and one of the things that's, that's been super interesting about journeying this as a married couple is obviously, you know, we don't want our business to wreck our marriage because ultimately yeah. at the end of the day, he's he's who I'm hanging out with. And ultimately the goal, the company hopefully won't be around forever. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and or, or at least we not under our leadership. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and even being parents yeah. of, of a daughter, adult daughter now and wanting to make sure that that we did that well because a lot of people that are entrepreneurs there's sacrifices at home that you get down to the end of the day and you've made the money and now you don't have anybody to share it with and spend any time with because there's no relationships with so those are pretty powerful moments that just have kind of we've had to we've had to come back and remember our whys multiple whys our daughter our marriage just our own mental and emotional health and and having a life outside of this because you know, one of the, the benefits of being our age at the moment is watching not only the dot com uh, and watching the Great Recession and watching what happened to a lot of our peers, a lot of our friends. And when they had all their eggs in one basket and they had all their life eggs in one basket and then it all fell apart because there's no guarantee, um, then all of a sudden it was like, well, those are those are good life notes of going, OK. I got to be careful not to get there. And it's owning a business and being successful at a business. It's super easy to get, kind of get sucked into that, that vacuum. Yeah. And you got to think, right, if you are, if your relationships are suffering, if everything, everything outside of your business is suffering, eventually all of that comes into your business because as much as we love this idea about how we can walk through the door of our business and suddenly we're in a completely different world everything else is outside the door we don't bring anything in with us and we just start from scratch every day isn't that yeah, a lovely I, fantasy I, I, I always tell my people you bring all of who you are to work so let's you know let's just own that and and work at getting healthier so that what we're bringing to work is healthy for us yeah. our, our people i mean we just took our whole staff through a year's worth of their own leadership coaching and, and understanding their own values and getting all that sussed out personally, right? Just just professional development for them because of mm -hmm. that very thing. You actually bring all of who you are to work. So let's do everything that's within our power to help all of who you are be healthy. Yeah, and, and I love that. The, I love that doing uh, what are your values because I do think that that's one thing a lot of people overlook or, or have never actually asked themselves that question like what are my values and you know when you when you reach um when you reach our age at least you can shrink them down to ones that really 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 matter um but a lot of people never do never ask that question what exactly are my values mm -hmm. yep. that's a and and it is it's real powerful and it's been interesting to watch because um you know our staff varies in ages also and watching our 20 somethings walk through the process and our 30 somethings and our 40 somethings all walk through the process and, and all at different stages in their life. But I've been really proud of our folks, especially the ones in their 20s who they're, they care, they're digging in. Um, 
you know, at some level, we talk about values a lot with our clients. We talk about it a lot in the office. So they, at some level, they drank Kool-Aid. Um, and we hired folks that actually uh, cared about that. But I just did a coaching session with one of our staff and she'd gone through three or four revs and she came to me. She, she got ready for our meeting and she sent me rev two after I'd given her some comments and we scheduled a meeting. And by the time we got to the meeting, she had rev three. And then we were able to do some coaching and refining. And I just, I'm just, I was able to look at her at the end of that session and just go, I am so proud of you because you're willing to do the internal work and look at inside and, and think about it and not let your ego get in the way. Or, you know, as she talks about the, the real pressure for that generation to have everything figured out by 30. Uh -huh. And if you don't, you're a failure. And yeah. Wow. All I can say, I was glad that wasn't the way when, when we were coming through because uh, when I say, uh, my, my, let's not talk about my 20s. <laughs> because it would be, you could ask me a lot of questions. I wouldn't have very many answers, but anyway. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, the, other, the other piece to the values thing, just to, um, you know, as we talk to business owners and leaders is really identifying company values. Like, yeah. Who are we as a company? What's the behavior that we want to have between us with our clients, what what are the things that matter to us that will define how we do business? And then once you've articulated those really clearly, then you hire, train, and fire to those core values. Mm -hmm. So that that obviously, as you can imagine, impacts your culture a great deal, right? If I'm hiring, training, and firing to the, to the values that are central to who we are, um, then that gives us a lot more opportunity to hire well. Yeah. Well, it, it well really and does. Yeah. And one of the things that I think happens with values too, and I think leaders miss this a lot because I don't, I don't know if anybody actually tells us this. I don't know if anybody told me this. Delegation is really important in business and it's a skill set. And one of the skills in that skill set is you have to be able to trust that people can be consistent. If you can teach your company values to your people, it's a huge element in delegation because now you know that they're going to behave within a certain construct. So your brand is intact. It doesn't get violated. It doesn't tear away your culture and it doesn't scare away prospects or customers because they were treated poorly. Unless that's a part of your, part of your core <laughs> values. <laughs> and then you win, I yeah, guess. Right. Yeah, no, I, I love that because uh, th that's another thing that sometimes people overlook is that your brand is is so many different things, but it is also all of your people and every interaction that they have, you know, both internally, but particularly externally. So if I get one experience from one person and another experience from a, a different person, okay, now, now I'm not sure I really trust the organization anymore. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We talk about the way we define it in our organization with our clients is brand equals reputation. And then we talk about branding as bonding. So if I'm building a reputation, if my reputation is my brand and the process of bonding with a client is the act of branding, uh, now all of a sudden with those two words, those two descriptions, we have a whole new approach oftentimes for leaders on, wait a minute, that's what marketing is about. That's what sales and customer service and actually creating a quality product or service on, on top of it that doesn't need to be replaced. Oh, that's a that's a different twist. That's a holistic twist. Yeah, and one thing I think is a little sad, but it's great. Uh, if it's great for people who want a competitive advantage, is that really good experiences stand out. Uh, you, know, I, I don't know how often we get ones from from like customers of ours who go, "Wow, your service was absolutely amazing," and you know we we do deliver amazing service, but the, the what I'm saying is. It stands out because of the other experiences. And I really think today, if you want to stand out, you know, really deliver, deliver fantastic service and actually take an interest in the people, your, your customers and take a real interest in them. And you will, I promise you, you'll stand out. Yep. Oh, it's yeah. powerful. 100%. And it's phenomenal for retention if you're in that kind of business, uh, which most people are. Retention is way cheaper than acquiring a new customer. And oh, yeah. My favorite, um, my favorite statement that comes from folks as they work with us and our staff and everything else is when they kind of often have that epiphany and it's sad, but it's great for us is I've never seen a company do this or I've never, I've never had this experience here or you'll do, you do that. Nobody else I've worked with has ever done that. And it's like, 
Yeah, and it doesn't cost us anymore, and we make more money and better margins, and and it's great. And um, I, so there was this story that we heard um, a friend of ours, a family member, uh, owns a company, a fairly large company, and he's originally from Ireland, and which makes well, him a wonderful we chap. Won't, yeah, we won't hold but, that against him. <laughs> right. Well, uh, so he he uh, his family were painters back in Ireland. And his dad was a painter and his grandfather was a painter and it was his grandfather's company. And as kids, they would work for him. And uh, the grandfather would come along and, you know, okay, you paint this wall. And he'd come back and he'd ask the question, okay, can you put my name to it? And then eventually he would teach them, can you put your name to it? Uh -huh. And, uh, or sometimes he would say, can you put your name to it? And they're like, well, yeah, I'm okay with that. Can you put my name to it? Because I can't put my name to that work. And we kind of, and we, and we took that into our culture. It's like, if I can put my name to something or our staff can put their name to something, there's a tremendous amount of gratitude at the end of the day of, I did a job well done. It's for what, I, what we call it is, it, I spent the day laboring and there was value that came out of it as opposed to just toiling at work. And I don't want to yeah. toil, I want to labor so that there's fruit at the end of the day. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, and I love that story too. Yeah, you could oh, let's trust the paddies to come up with good... Uh... Good analogies there. <laughs> whether they're, whether uh, they're true or not. Whether they're true or not doesn't matter. They're not true, they should be. That's all that matters. <laughs> yes. Yes, you gotta you always gotta be careful because you know Irish people, we're natural born storytellers. That's our whole culture. So every time you will I, I guarantee if he told you that story again, it'd probably add a little bit to it. Yeah, that's, that's like yeah. Well listen, this has been fantastic. I know we could talk for hours here. It's it's such wonderful uh, insights. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. So we're a company that works with leaders and companies. So we do business development, and leadership development. And our main focus is developing the whole leader for the whole business. We do coaching, we do consulting, and we do various services in the marketing arena also. Um, and one of the things we wanted to offer today, because we love leadership development so much, was a basic assessment, if anybody's interested in it. And it's a scorecard. And the name of our company, again, is Half a Bubble Out. And if you go to halfabubbleout.com slash scorecard, you can get this free scorecard. And it gives you a, 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 at least a basic ability to assess your leadership, kind of looks at your company holistically, and then give you a, some perspective. And if nothing else, we want you to get a little bit of perspective on your leadership from something, a tool at all. And this is a great way to just start that process or continue that process of self-learning as a leader. Yeah, that's fantastic. So all of the links and, and uh, the links to the website and the links to to the assessment and all that, we'll put that below the uh, below the video so you can access it. That's fantastic. Listen, I, I'm I'm so grateful for both of you today for doing this. It's a uh, as I said, we could have gone on for hours. It's absolutely fantastic. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Michael. And thank you thank all you. for watching and listening. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon.